Well, I'm saying the librarian is so important in these first three steps because I train a lot of systematic reviewers. And, and when they get to this point, this is when I send them to their librarian. So they'll often come, and I'm sure many librarians will see researchers come in, and this much they've attempted themselves. So sometimes you're taking a step back when you're dealing with the researchers, because it's not often that we involve our librarians right at the start in this review process, unfortunately in many cases, because it would be a lot easier sometimes to be able to do that. But you'll often catch them here when they've already attempted all of that. So, as I said, what, what do the researchers, what do the reviewers know? Well, we lead them through the, qu the question, through the PICO. We help them define eligibility criteria. When we're teaching them, when we're training people how to do systematic reviews, and um, we show them an example search strategy. We tell them all the places they can go and search, and then they move into it. And the first thing we tell them when it comes to searching is that they should be looking to see if there are any other systematic reviews conducted on this topic. And if there are, then they sh good systematic reviews that is, then they shouldn't be doing it. Unlike primary research, there's no added value of redoing a systematic review more than once, a good systematic review. Sometimes, yes, they do need updating, and they need updating often as more research is added to any particular field. At this point, it's worth taking a step back um, and just to bring the systematic reviewer and the search that they undertake um, back into that field of evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based practice in general. An evidence-based practitioner, that is a clinician, for example, using evidence to inform their practice, would use a similar approach of asking a question in an answerable format. But the way they'll approach their searching is quite different from the systematic reviewer or the places, sorry, that they'll look to conduct their search. Here's the 5S pyramid, which started as a 4S and now has graduated to a 6S pyramid, of how some of this information is organised. Um, now, the evidence-based practitioner, when they have a question, will start as close to the top as possible. For example, there are very few clinical computerised decision support systems available, but summaries, for instance, are some of what you'll find in the JBI Connect Plus database, which is a point-of-care uh, online system of evidence. Um, the systematic reviewer, on the other hand, beyond that first look to see if any similar systematic reviews have been conducted that I just mentioned, they might look here towards the syntheses, will be conducting all of their search at this level of studies, at this primary research literature, which they'll then accumulate in relation to their question and look to synthesise the best available evidence from amongst there. It will be at this point that the researcher may appear at your door um, for help in conducting the search. Um, and depending on that knock of the door, you might find that there's quite a different person standing there. It may be the academic researcher, it may be a methodologist with some experience in conducting systematic reviews, it may be a clinician who's, had, uh, who's con doing something in practice and has a real interest to see if it's the right thing to do or the right way to do a particular thing in practice. Or it may very well be a student who's undertaking this as a part of a research project. Um, and they will have different levels of experience in conducting systematic reviews. Um, in some cases, they may not entirely understand what a systematic review is, or if it is the most appropriate type of research for the particular question that they have. Because a systematic, there are some questions which aren't appropriate for a systematic review. But who this particular person is that's knocking on your door, and where they're coming from, will impact and dictate to some extent the sort of interaction that you as the librarian have with them. Um, but it's so important that it's clear that the researcher, that the team involved, the librarian yourself, know and understand the question. What is the relevant PICO? Um, what type of evidence, what type of question is being asked that lends itself to a particular type of evidence? Is it more appropriate that this be broken down into multiple questions? And there are many reviews which might address multiple questions. Are there extra concepts or less concepts that need to be considered than what is presented purely by just looking at the PICO itself? An example there may be of extra concepts may be, I mentioned before, if our population were um, diabetics being um, 
are being treated in community clinics as opposed to the hospital. Well, if we were looking at that conceptually, what we'll find is that that one defining feature of the population now would be broken into two concepts. And when I conduct my search, I won't see the diabetics and the, uh, the community setting in one concept, conceptual uh, column in this case, but rather I'd see that broken into two. So we've added an extra concept there. But here, this is an example of how we essentially teach our reviewers to search. Um, in this case, we're interested in nursing management of cancer fatigue in patients. So there are three concepts here, the cancer, the fatigue, the nursing. And we tell our, this is using the Boolean operator or um, the different keywords or mesh headings that they know of that could describe this concept here for fatigue. And we combine all of those with the Boolean operator or. So we're getting as much as possible here. Then to really address this question, we want to tie it all together. So after they've arranged this sort of concept map that we call it, we tie the cancer and fatigue and nursing conceptually. And our search will spit out the results that contain any one of these terms with any one of the others. And that will essentially form the results of our search and our search strategy. But this is what researchers really struggle with and why it's so important that librarians are involved and how that they, they can actually really make sure that the most comes out of a search strategy is that the, the tools that we use to search databases don't necessarily conceptualise things the way we do. And sometimes we struggle with that. We might, at often the same words that are used have different definitions and meanings. They're not necessarily all related to that con our concept of interest. And sometimes the opposite is true. Different words have the same definitions and meanings. But we have to be clear that we know how the databases are organised conceptually. And that takes in itself quite a bit of research. Sometimes the researchers and the reviewers don't actually appreciate is necessary to do what the scope of a particular mesh heading is that has a one word title. And that's really where librarians can help really make sure that the search is hitting, that that is aligned with what the question is asking and the PICO concepts that have come out of it. The other problem often that you will come to appreciate is that sometimes not everyone comes armed with their own question. It might be the funders that have given them a particular question. And some of these questions, if they're broad, and they often are, sometimes the research is only the middleman, and conceptually they're not clear on what the question is all about. And you'll see that, and in preparing for this, I did actually take the time to go and essentially interview our research librarian at the University of Adelaide where I work. And I could see the frustration appear in her eyes, really pointing out that so many reviewers or people who go looking to the literature to find research evidence, they have this major difficulty being able to conceptualise their question. They can't describe what they're trying to do. When they're put to the question, we're scratching our heads and we really cannot describe it. And often the librarian finds themselves in a position where they're trying to actually interpret what the aims of the project are, just in delving into trying to get the search strategy right. These are some of the other lines that I've heard quite often from librarians. This is describing the people that come to them looking for help to search. That we have no capacity to be logical. The logic grid doesn't reflect what she's trying to do. It's not rocket science. But that the essential elements are language and logic. And sometimes we don't actually speak the right language. We don't actually know the language that some of these databases are speaking, and we don't know how to organise those concepts to be able to maximise the return from these databases. So the other thing, researchers, people like me, often fail to appreciate that the search is such an incredibly important part of the review process. I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk about what's, what a systematic review is. Both of those statements started out with, it's an attempt. There's no guaranteed result. You're attempting to do all of this, identify, appraise and synthesise the research evidence. Sometimes we might end up with an empty review. There's actually no studies, good studies in relation to this question. What we don't want to do is 
a not search or not find evidence that actually exists when it's out there because then we look pretty silly. But in essence, the key feature to be aware of as a reviewer and someone working on a review project is that if we don't find any research evidence, in essence, we, don't, we haven't done a systematic, we, we haven't got the systematic review. So how to search and where to search are some of the defining features of the review process. And there are many, many systematic reviews out there which, for example, say we searched Medline. That, to me, doesn't sit as a systematic review. A systematic review search should be much more comprehensive than that, but I'll speak to you a bit more about that in just a moment. But one thing researchers will understand in constructing this whole search strategy is this idea of reproducibility. And one of the core features of a systematic review is that if any other person or any other reviewer took that question and applied the same uh, steps, the same methodology of review, and importantly, the same search strategy, they should end up with roughly the same conclusions that you do by the end of it. And to be able to do that, they must see your search strategy and it must be documented clearly in how that, and you should see that in a systematic review and be able to see how a, a question has evolved into a search strategy. It's all required that it's reported. So again, it's just, we spoke about the difficulties moving from a question to the, and asking it in an answerable format, creating that PICO uh, to inform your inclusion criteria and eligibility criteria. And sometimes even in the search strategy, that falls apart. It's confusing when some questions don't have all the elements of a PICO. Okay, sometimes the comparator, for instance, is often not stipulated in a question is slightly broader. They're just looking to the effectiveness of an intervention and, and trying to identify what comparisons are being made in the literature. There may be different elements, which I mentioned already in an example of different settings. But for the most part, for someone with experience in systematic reviews, the search strategy and developing the search strategy is, I believe, infinitely more important than the search itself. And we certainly invest a great deal more time getting the strategy right. Once we've got that right, going to the databases and doing the search actually isn't that time consuming. And that's sometimes difficult to swallow for the researcher who's looking for the results. And we're really interested in the, you know, the glory of the systematic review, which is the synthesizing and coming out with the results. Everything else can be a bit of a nuisance. But if we don't find the research, we can't do that. That's why this is so important. Even though it's probably the, you know, the searching, I describe it as the least romantic part of the systematic review process, but it is probably one of the most important parts of the review process. It's very easy to turn around and redo a meta-analysis and redo the statistics. It's not easy to go back and redo the search because you're basically starting again from scratch.